Um, welcome to South Asian Voices, Culture, Craft, and Comics, where we are going to talk about culture, craft, and comics um, with this amazing lineup of uh, panelists. So we have, I'm going to actually ask them to introduce themselves and talk about their projects they're working on. Um, do we want to start with Sakeo? Uh, hi, I'm Tawana Sakeo. I'm currently a graphic, de a graphic designer at Plastic, as well as a punk artist at Night and Right. Um, I think most people know me from the Elements Anthology. I have a comic in that. I also have a comic in Dirty Diamonds, and I am working on a graphic novel. Possibly coming out 2020, depending on how fast I work. <laughs> um, I'm Priyana Hawk, and I'm a comic artist. Um, I write and draw my own work. I've done a lot of work for anthologies. Um, I've been in the Mid and Keep It Lovely Geeks and Dirty Diamonds. Veronica Agarwal. Uh, I'm working on a middle grade graphic novel for hire, and I also have a secret project <laughs> in the works. Um, and I've also been in Elements, and I've also been in Jar of Magic. I'm Anita Zane. I may be an illustrator when I got peer pressured into comics. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, did uh, illustrations for uh, different anthologies. I was in um, what's it? Six Word Stories' latest book, Fresh Off the Boat. And I'm working on so many secret projects mm -hmm. that my publishing list looks very small. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Nidhi Chani. My graphic novel, Kashmina, came out last year. I'm also um, just wrapped, actually, a picture book that will be out in May of next year called I Will Be Fierce with uh, writer B. Birdsong. And then my next graphic novel, Jukebox, which is about two Muslim American girls who find a jukebox that takes them back in time when they put on a record, uh, will be out in 2021 with her second book. Uh, my name is Amos Hirsch. Uh, I've been doing comics since 2009. My clothes have been online at Jarring Radio. I work with my partner, Yuka Oda, for the most part, on uh, my books here. Uh, Lucky Penny, our cats on the train, has come out. Um, my current comic that we're doing right now is a uh, Queer Lives Online called Barbarous. And we just announced a book with uh, Abrams with uh, Jen Boyle called Mirror Lens. Hi, I'm Jessica Hall. I'm a in America, you know, we are South Asians, South Asian Americans, Indian Americans, or Pakistani Americans. Um, so how do you identify, and how does that identity come into play when you're creating? And anyone can kind of jump in and answer. Um, personally, I, I have a kind of a diaspora relationship with my Indian um, identity. My parents are actually from Trinidad, so technically we consider ourselves West Indian. Um, they are from India, but displaced by uh, a lot of British imperialism, and they ended up in Trinidad. So, but myself, I grew up stateside in the tri-state area. So, to me, my primary my primary identity for a long time was New Englander, then Indian American, and then whatever I was after. Um, so personally, it hasn't figured a lot into my work until very recently, because for me, my identity is very personal, and I don't like having it questioned. I don't like having it interrogated by outsiders, because it's a conversation with myself. Um, and how I'm feeling about my particular culture, my ties are not very strong. So when I try to reclaim it, um, <laughs> but um, yeah. So I, it's it's for me. It's it's a label that I carry for myself, and whether it shows up in my work or not is my decision. And generally, I don't because it's I, it's just my thing. And whether it if it figures into the work as me as a working professional. 
school or as a topic is up to me. And um, yeah, basically it's my choice and it shows up when it shows up. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Bangladeshi American, um, or on the track of the first generation American, because um, my family immigrated here. Um, I think I relate to Joanna in some ways because of the diaspora aspect that I'm more of a first generation diaspora. It's just my identity informs my work um, because I do a lot of autobio work. So been hired to do work that um, talks about race <laughs> and trauma, so you can't, I can't really separate that from my past, I guess. I, I talk a lot about identity in my work, um, but my fantasy work, it, it, it's a hard question on that one. It's like, you, it's hard, I, I just try really hard not to think of myself in terms of um, an other. <laughs> generation on my Indian side of the family that I've moved here from India. Um, so I actually struggle a lot with my identity and dealing with, you know, how to identify and how to, you know, if that if I am like Indian enough or if I am like brown enough for a lot of situations. Um, so in my work I usually have a lot of characters of color that aren't super attached to any specific culture because I'm so removed from my own culture and it's very Strange for me, and I usually feel pretty inadequate a lot of the time. Um, so I actually need to focus on that more instead of like the other way around, like the normalization of it, of like representative people who don't necessarily feel attached to the culture. Uh, I'm what someone once called a, a 1.5 generation. Like I, I was born in Bangladesh. And then I came here, and then I never left here. Um, and I hate when people keep describing this as um, juggling two different worlds, um, like as if I'm half of one and half of the other in some way. It's more like I'm my own world in and of itself, and my own experience is a singular one because I'm a single person. I can't split myself in half, so I can't designate my experience as half anything. Um, and when I make work, it's usually me figuring myself out, I think, and the kind of world that I want to be. Like, if, if Bangladeshi culture or more of the American culture, if, if I don't fit neatly into either one of them, I'm making that culture that I want it to be for myself in my work, laying down that foundation so that one whole identity that I'm in. Um, also, I, I identify as angry. <laughs> <laughs> so I identify as Indian American, and Kashmina was definitely my identity work. Um, I grew up in Los Angeles with a humongous Indian American community. Uh, my parents immigrated here. I was born in India w when I was four months old. So I would like to borrow that 1.5 generation um, because I don't necessarily feel like the way that I would be defined makes sense because I was born there and I'm very proud of that fact, but I did come here when I was four months old. So um, I feel very Californian. and. Um, when I look at the work that I'm making, when I think about what I want to do and what I want to create, I'm kind of creating for the little girl who didn't see herself in any books, any greeting cards, any art. And so I definitely populate the worlds that I create with South Asian characters, South Asian narratives. I also don't want to be pigeonholed, so I like to gravitate towards other work that allows me to um, Flex my story muscles in a different way. So that's kind of a little bit, a little bit of everything. Um, 
for me, uh, I identify as Indian American. Um, I think I think it's something that I have. I, I've always identified as Indian American in terms of the label. I think in terms of claiming my identity for my work is something that's come in my later years. Probably I'm only 30 now, 30 and after. Um, yeah, I, I think growing up it can be difficult because uh, there are a lot of people outside of yourself. One of you said something about you just be what your you are your interior world. Yeah, and I this is something that I've come to very late in life, I, or latest in my life. Um, uh, I think it's just one of those things where when you grow up in the U.S., there are a lot of people who tell you what your identity is, you know. Um, and it doesn't just come from, uh, you know, like the American culture side. It can also come from the Indian culture side. You know, like we're not Indian enough for Indian community sometimes, uh, but we're also not American enough for uh, American. Uh, you know, I'm saying American, but like white culture basically. Um, and so, yeah, it's really just been something I've come to more recently. And so. Uh, Marilyn sort of will touch on a few things that I'm finally uh, thinking about and um, some of the projects that I'm pitching going forward uh, are going to be more oriented around sort of Indian um, culture, mythology. Uh, uh, there's a project that, it's like a secret project, but you know, drawing on textiles and stuff from my parents' home state, stuff like that. So it's something that I'm trying to incorporate now and incorporate now and sort of try to Claim for myself, I guess. So to that end, you know, you all kind of spoke about the, the personal nature of identity, but there are still just a few of us in terms of widespread access to these comics and, and these stories that we're telling. Um, how do you... There's, there's this need sometimes, or this, this call for every story to be everything to every person, which it, it can't be, but how is that burden of representation something you think about when you're creating, and how do you balance that with the creation without losing your losing what the essence of what the thing is that you're creating? Well, so I, I think about it a lot in terms of representation and worrying about being a monolith, especially because, as you said, there's so few books that do represent our culture. And I worry a lot about if I am representing one aspect of myself, especially as being like a mixed person and not including things that I don't know about, which is a lot, you know, am I doing kind of an injustice? And of course, you can't actually realistically expect that from someone, but it's still something that does come up a lot when I'm and I think most of the time, to kind of reconcile that, as I said before, I just don't assign a lot of self-worth to my characters, so I can kind of get away with like not thinking too much about how little I know myself. Um, yeah. uh, for for me, I mean, I I think all of us we don't really have the luxury of not being aware or not having some sense of. Um, not urgency, but some sense of critical need to represent ourselves and what culture we identify with. We don't have the luxury of decoupling ourselves from that because we're not allowed to. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot, for, for me, in the very beginning, it was definitely more of a concern because I, I didn't grow up with any other Indian cartoonists. I didn't know any. Um, I knew there were cartoons, but all my heroes were white. Um, I would read Tintin and read Asterix. I would read things that did not come from my culture and identify with the craft over myself. Um, and that kind of showed up in the be very, very beginnings of my work where I would start, I would mostly do comics about myself because the culture was kind of built in. But as I've gotten older, um, I've begun to prioritize creators over their work so much, like not not in the the sense of I don't appreciate the work that is from a marginalized person, but to me the important thing is that they are the person who will look. Whether they could have characters that are all white, they could have characters that reflect their culture, they could have completely other cultures in there or abilities. 
um, or sexuality. But to me, once I started prioritizing the existence of that person doing the work and being a necessary cog in the whole um, this whole art form, it became more of a thing for me to just kind of release that burden for myself. I can't be a read Indian person, and I don't want to be. But um, I mean, that would be madness. I already have enough work as it is. But um, for me, it the burden was a little bit lifted. I can do what I do, and I can do. Um, I can put myself in in the work or my culture in the work to a certain degree because I've prioritized myself doing the work over the work actually describing me. It's my work. It's going to describe me no matter what I do. Yeah, I think a lot about how our hands are our hands. So my hands are the body's hands. And any work that I do is going to be Bangladeshi American. So I try not to worry about it too much, I guess. I resent being a spokesperson for a billion people. Um, I'm also Muslim American, and I do editorial illustrations fairly often. And because I get tagged in these articles about Muslim people, yeah, you can imagine my mentions, I bet. Um, um, there's also things like, because there's so few of us, the things that we do get magnified. Um, and so if I were to talk about something uh, really bad that happened to me, that somehow becomes representative of my demographic, and I'm not that real of a human being. Neither are people like me. So it, it, it becomes what is the word? A, a burden in and of itself that uh, not a lot of other kinds of creators, like people with more representation in the world, have to deal with. I think um, when I think about the work that I create and putting things in there that are, I guess, culture tagged or um, informative of my culture, I like to think of it as powerful. I like to think of it as something that somebody who comes from a similar background will see and feel represented or feel seen, um, whether it's mentioning samosas or throwing some hindi into um, a text or throwing a word that somebody who isn't from the culture would have to look up and learn about and would hopefully help them understand the people that are around them. So to create that empathy, um, I think that when I think about it as a burden, then I don't want to do the work, you know, and when I think about it as a power that I, I feel very fortunate that I'm in this place that I get to make books, that they get published. And so in that, in that, um, trajectory. I'm trying to put things in that, again, are um, for that little girl that didn't see herself in the book, but also really connecting with this power that I find myself in to help folks see, be seen and help other folks come to the culture and come to these gifts of identity and learn something from them. Um, I also think that what you're saying is interesting considering this panel um, about not feeling Indian enough. Mm -hmm. and I never feel that ever. <laughs> like it's just like you are the one cartoonist, the artist in the in, you know in the Indian Desi party um, at a wedding. Like people, it, I just went to my cousin's wedding. Mm -hmm. Reason, like, do you know how, how did you how did you do this? How did you become this? Like how did you convince your family? You know, Maybe, so like, that's my next question. This, right? yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like um, I, I don't know. We just snuck through and and I've done school visits and I've done library presentations and um, a lot of the libraries and schools that bring me out will have one to many um, Indian kids in their uh, student body and their parents and kids will come up and it's that there's that power again you know that power again seeing somebody that's in a non-traditional role um, and thinking that they don't have to become a doctor or a lawyer or engineer, you know, and they can free themselves to thinking that this hobby, this um, starving artist idea and concept that they have because they haven't seen somebody in that role um, is something that we are all breaking down, you know, and that's to me why I put these gifts of 
identity and why I think it's important for me to put my, um, you know, like, I don't know why I'm using identity tag, but, um, you know, these um, characters into to the books that I make. Yeah, I, I agree with that. The power of being seen, I think, it's so weird. Like, I, uh, I think the first book that I did was Yuko's autobio, so it was incidentally representative in the sense that I was in it. But there were very few, there was like a comedy they called about Diwali, and then maybe like, uh, yeah, there was just was not a lot in there. And then the second character we did, or the second character, the second book we did, had uh, a mostly white cast, you know. And it was around that time I read an interview uh, with somebody who was talking about identity and network and how they had essentially like erased themselves uh, because they had grown up without representation. And that got me thinking, that got us thinking, and. It's one of those things now where, uh, no matter what, I think in every work that I do, I'm gonna try to put an Indian character in because the power of just having a character there is surprising because when it wasn't, I didn't think that I wasn't there. You know, it just, it never occurred to me. Um, yeah, uh, as far as it being a burden or a monolith, I, I don't know how to answer that really. What I will say is that, so I, I came up in web comics. I started in like 2004. I worked with a friend, uh, Muhammad Huck, who was uh, Bengali. Uh, we did a comic together for years. Uh, besides him and myself, uh, I don't think I saw a single like South Asian face for like 10 years or something. You know, like the fact that we're up here right now all talking together is like pretty incredible to me. Um, uh, it just has completely changed in the past like five or three years. You know, it's amazing. Like it, it feels great. You know, um, so in that sense, you know, like I, I, I'm not gonna lie. Like I think it was hard when I was starting out. You know, um, and there just were not a lot of other South Asian people to talk to because, um, yeah, you just you end up feeling a little bit isolated. But I, I have felt over the past like two, three, four years. Uh, whatever burden I was feeling slowly being lifted because of who I was with. I just want to say that um, I started doing comics uh, right when I started reading John Wonder. Oh my god. Um, mm -hmm. And the moment that I realized that you and Yuko were like siblings, I was so proud. And it really made me so proud to have actually make it. So just so you know, like just like it wasn't anything just in your work, it was just you both existed in time. <laughs> switching gears just a little bit, we're going to come back to the concept, but something I want to ask, and maybe you, you touched on this um, in your answer, which is that, you know, the, the South Asian community traditionally and, and physically sometimes is not the most supportive of their children going into creative fields. Um, it's delicate as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very the nicest thing I've ever heard anyone put it. <laughs> very good at being diplomatic. Um, <laughs> I mean, my, my my family has, like, writer, graphic design, and artist, and my mom literally was like, I can't believe I taught you to think for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> She's very proud now, but long time coming. But, you know, was it a difficult path for you? And, and do you have advice for for kids who might want to do this but are coming up against some familiar frustrations in their family or in their community? Bad Indian, really. Um, my family, since we're very, we're we're kind of diaspora upon diaspora. Um, my Trinidadian-based family didn't really. They just wanted me to make money. Um, they they weren't sure how I was going to be doing this. Um, they were hoping for a doctor or a scientist, obviously, but I I don't ever recall any major pushback. It was mostly about how are you going to support yourself, and I think my I am the only artist in my whole entire family, which is kind of bonkers, and I'm wondering where the other hidden cousin is. <laughs> but yeah, she's there, I know it. But um, like I I think because I was such an outlier, they didn't really put a lot of burden on me to become anything. I was I was the eldest of my small family and my mom's very unusual. Um, she was a very um, 
unique mother who is just happy to have me be somebody excellent. It didn't matter what I was going to be. She likes to remind me that at some point I wanted to be a surgeon, ballerina, belly dancer, paleontologist. <laughs> but that was one year. So she reminded me, she reminds me a lot that she didn't care as long as I was the best at surgeon, belly dancer, et cetera, et cetera. If I was the best one, she was fine with it. So for me, um, it, I kind of basically went into hiding when it came to my family. I was just under the radar, not the loudest cousin, not the loudest sibling, um, just doing my thing and grinding and grinding and grinding. And I think now that they've kind of started to see where it's gotten me and they've, they've seen how I've been kind of helping other people come up and making a difference for a lot of, um, I think they've become a lot more aware of representational problems because they've been seeing how hard I've had it and they've seen how little kids will come up to me and be like, oh my God, I never thought like, we can do this? This is allowed? And this is like the world's, yeah, you, of course you can. Just, you know, be the best at it. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure, no pressure yeah. as my mother would say. But um, yeah, like it, they've been wildly accepting now that they're, they're like, oh, she's, although <laughs> now that I've been in the paper a few times, they've, they've kind of opened up. Although wildly, the Tony Bourdain article that I had in the New York Times was, I think that kind of weirdly opened up the doors for my art career. Now they're like, oh, she can be famous. <laughs> <laughs> so this is great. They just care if they can brag They about just it. care if they can brag <laughs> is what it is. Like, that currency is nice. But at, at the bottom line, they were mostly super excited that I was happy and I was doing something that had meaning and that was making them proud. I think that's, that's basically where they are right now. It took a little bit, but we got there. I have horror stories and flashbacks of being a child and wanting to be an artist or actually any other career besides a doctor. I would pitch any other career besides a doctor to my parents. They would all get shut down because I have to. Um, I, I hate the sight of blood, by the way, so that was in the New York Times. Um, and I happen to have a talent for art, as my teachers would put it. Um, I didn't even think I would make it this far, but I, ha I was lucky enough to meet a series of people that believed in me. My parents were never in that series of people. Um, but the first time I had a book come out, even though my years of my parents telling me I wasted my life, my mom asked me, where can I buy this book? <laughs> and she was like very adamant that she wanted to buy this book and she like tells all her friends to just honestly with her She's gonna be people. facing those out at Barnes and Noble. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, getting that support uh, later in life is, has been strange but uh, welcoming. They no longer tell me I'm wasting my life, although I feel that like little level of, I don't know what you do, but I wish you didn't do it. It's <laughs> like in their hand. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to follow that? <laughs> I can follow it with a completely opposite story. <laughs> because, um, so I grew up, I was the only grandchild for a while. Um, but like since just like the way my family was structured, like my grandparents were very, very loving and I was very lucky that everyone in my family was just kind of like wanting to do what made me happy. Um, so I was very lucky that I had, you know, the support of my grandparents and I have the support of my dad who really just wants me to like, you know, kind of as Siobhan said, like if you're doing this, just like, you know, go for it. And he's very supportive. Um, and I think part of what drives me as well is to, like make my dad proud and make my grandparents proud for supporting me and my mom as well obviously but and then also to inspire kids to to see like because our world is fairly community in that sense so like to see that and have that like moment of recognition kind of as we discussed like regardless of the content just seeing that the creator is there is something that is really important to me and just to like put out there south asian kids um, take down all South Asian artists' names and make a PowerPoint for your parents. <laughs> uh, 
because um, one of the arguments I always got was that th we don't know any South Asian artists. We don't do art, but we know like 80 doctors. Be that. <laughs> <laughs> That's weirdly, because what, what happened, it's just interesting <coughs> to hear that because I think the more time goes on, the more I realize I'm a weird outlier. Because my parents, like, well, not so much my dad, but he doesn't really know what to do with art. But my mother definitely, put together like a whole like scrapbook and slideshow once she realized I wanted to be an artist. And she's very aware of the rich Indian history of art and of painting and documentation, textiles. She put together a whole scrapbook and was like, here's some inspiration for you. We have the longest. She's very sweet when she wants to be. Yeah. <laughs> but she put together that whole thing. So for me, like, I, I wish more of our parents that because we do have a rich history of art and a huge creative culture that goes all the way back to the Indus River Valley. So I do wish I would hear from a lot more of our, our people that, you know, there's room for it because there's always been room for it. I have a conspiracy theory. <laughs> so my conspiracy theory is that because immigrants have had to mainly focus on surviving, mm -hmm. they can't afford to yes, get do things that are like very financially heavy, have low um, return rate as far as like yeah. success mm -hmm. goes, and there are tons of gatekeepers in all of them. Mm -hmm. um, and all those things uh, compound into them focusing on survival and focusing on uh, like helping you become uh, something that will be a success in this like very hostile environment that they're in. But because they only focus on like STEM careers um, for uh, making money and survival, they like the culture ends up becoming conservative. There's like feedback because there's no like people like you hardly hear from people in the humanities and like critiquing the culture and like my parents are so uh, paranoid of losing the culture, but they refuse to make artists. <laughs> What are you gonna do? <laughs> I think that people from all over the world have this issue with um, like, I, for me at least, I, the I need to go. I don't. My, my family doesn't want me, um, and art was never ever ever an option because it's fucking expensive. So like, it was even less about like, of course you're not gonna make money doing art for them. That is what they would say. But there is this like anger. I wonder if it comes from this place of like we had to suffer, like you don't get to have a passive entry into art. And which of course the irony is that being an artist is like really, really hard. <laughs> so it's not an easy path to take, but they don't know that because they're not doing it. Um, so yeah, I, I really wish that more at least um, at least the Explora family would be open to the idea that that it's okay to not to not suffer and that you won't just get to fix suffering <laughs> and um, that art is important if, if you want to work if you're surviving you can do it. Well, I think you can also predict success right I mean it's it's that idea like for me I wish my mom could talk to Siobhan's mom like yeah. 10 yeah. years ago 10 her. years ago like I, I wish that we could have just introduced them so because um, now, now my, my family, my parents, they're all like on board. But initially, <laughs> you know, it makes it really easy to support somebody when they're successful. Um, but, uh, you know, initially it was, wait, but how? How, how do you do this? And so I, I had um, gotten out of college and gone straight into nonprofits because for me, it was not necessarily that I wanted to do things that made me happy. I just wanted to do things that were meaningful. And I was a terrible artist. Um, and so, but I really loved art and I wanted to get better at it. And the only way that I knew how to go about doing that, because it's very Indian for me, was to go to school. And then I dropped out. Um, and I still feel like if my, yeah, if my parents, like, re if you really talk to them, they'll say, but you should still go to school. <laughs> even though, even though you have like books coming out, like regularly, you should still go back and finish your art degree. Um, and uh, and so it was also that situation for me where I didn't know any artists. I didn't have any idea of how I would go about getting better. And so I 
went to school. And then when I got to school, I was like, well, most artists didn't ever go to school, so I kind of don't need this now that I feel like I know what I'm kind of doing. Um, yeah. And, and so um, I think that initially it's hard for any, at least in my family, in that I don't think it's conspiracy theory, actually. I think you're, you had a very astute observation yeah. about the immigrant tradition, right? You come, you most of my family, like I have a humongous family, um, came with not that much money and not that much opportunity. And so what are the tracks that you know are guaranteed? You're guaranteed to get a job, you're guaranteed to make a good living, um, all those things that can, can enable them to feel like they're putting you out into the world secure, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that there that's a huge concern and that's where a lot of this um, lack of support comes from because mm -hmm. they don't have examples um, and there isn't a track. Mm -hmm. Like I dropped out of art school, but I'm still here doing this thing. So um, whereas, you know, to become a doctor, there's a track, you follow it, you become a doctor. You Maybe know, an so. artist is still secure. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, uh, no, no, I was, I was listening back at something you said. Um, I'll come back to me. But yeah, that, with my parents, it was definitely a war of attrition. Um, they definitely wanted me to go into STEM. Uh, like in middle school, I was in a math, science, computer science minor. In high school, I was in math, science, computer science minor. When I went to college, um, uh, it was the same thing. You know, they wanted, and they very much knew what they wanted for me. Um, and it was, I think, around my sophomore year of college, everything kind of came to a head, and I was like, listen. You gotta at least let me try the arts, and so I want me to try out graphic design, um, and that's what I did. I ended up getting a degree in graphic design, and I worked full time doing that. I think three or four years while doing comics on the side with the, my friend Muhammad, who I had met in the same sophomore year of college, um, and they they became they slowly became more supportive, but it was it always started as like. Oh yeah, you know it's good, but maybe you should think about going back to school. Or, uh, you know, uh, I, after I stopped working three or four years uh, after I graduated college, they're like, yeah, maybe you should, you know, start putting a portfolio together. And yeah, it wasn't until very recently that they really came around. I think, uh, and I don't really feel that pushback anymore. And I get it. Oh, what I was going to say was that, yeah, I don't think it's a conspiracy theory either. You know, immigrant families come over here essentially to make wealth. You know, like, it's for the opportunity. Um, and, uh, you know, they want to see that wealth continue because what, what they, I, I think, what they see is, is the, the family needs to build a foundation, you know, so they can be here for uh, generations, you know. Um, and so, yeah, art doesn't really fit that, uh, I think, like, template. It, it's sad, though, because if more parents were more supportive of their kids pursuing the humanities and the arts and things, then we have more representation. Yeah. We'd end up being treated better. Yeah, no, and it's so funny because growing up, I had these conversations with my parents about, yeah, you know, they would say, oh, yeah, you know, someone, and there should really be some Indian actors in Hollywood, you know, there should really be uh, uh, like, you know, someone should take the Mahabharat and turn it into a comic book, you know? And I was just like, who do you think is going to do that? You know? <laughs> <laughs> who's who's going to do that into the world? one guy that was an yeah, actor yeah. for 50 years right. and suddenly <laughs> decides to make a comic, that's who's going to do it. Yeah, no, <laughs> Once he's retired, yeah. with money. <laughs> right. Yeah, um, yeah, no, and, and that's another thing, like, uh, you know, sometimes these retirement projects do happen. People do do that, but uh, I, I don't think it functionally works the way it works when you have young people who come up in the industry, who uh, you know can talk about their uh, sort of the, like the expanse of their experience, you know, and contextualize it in like an American context. You know, um, uh, I think that's very important in order to make a body of work that persists. You know. Um, Anyway, uh, my advice would be to, uh, man, I don't know, do your thing. I, I would say, like, keep at it. Um, but also, don't hesitate to 
you know, if, if you find yourself going into a field that's not art or comics, it doesn't mean you can't do one side, especially when you're younger. When you're older, you get tired. But <laughs> when, you, when you're younger, you can definitely do it. You know, there's so many comic artists who uh, got out of the lab. I would say advice um, is your parents aren't your only source of support when championing, mm -hmm. championing your work. So look for other folks, maybe a teacher, librarian, mm -hmm. Um, you know, somebody who could maybe help or mentor you, um, that's something that I had at, that I didn't really recognize until much later, but there was an English teacher that showed a lot of interest in my writing, and I hung out in her classroom every day after school. Um, it was much more ideal than going home, um, where, you know, it's just not like the welcoming, supportive environment that I wanted to be. So if there's a place that, you know, can give you that, because um, sometimes our parents just
single minded bloody like bloody minded. I say bloody minded because it's almost anger. Mm -hmm. Um that complete infatuation with yourself and your work. <laughs> so that's really I mean everything else is like pay your bills, but <laughs> also be so like don't have a little bit of an ego. Don't worry about it. Like do what you gotta do and just think you're the cock of the walk. Whatever you gotta do. I think uh, I definitely echo everything that everybody else has said. And also just like community is so important. And that's one of the things that drew me into comics from the beginning was like how good our community is and how much we help each other and how much we lift each other up. And so like, you know, if you are starting out and you're struggling, don't be afraid to yeah, I follow all of them on Twitter. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> that's, I know, that's the that. real support. Yeah. The follow <laughs> Um, but just like being able to have people who you can lean on and who can lift you up and who can help you is like, it's something that keeps me going personally. So I feel like it's so important to build around yourself if you don't have a support system in your family. Yeah, make one. Yeah. Just make one. Yeah. Found family is just as important. How can the South Asian community support creators? How, what is the best way? I mean, Obviously, spend money on your work. <laughs> spend money on their work. Um, but what what is the way? You know, you we saw this. It was the, the the summer of Asians. We saw Crazy Rich Asians. We saw the immense amount of support that the community created and and continues to um, create in that way. So, what can the South Asian community do? Like, how? What can we do? I show up. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, yeah, spend money too. Uh, obviously, that's going to always be my first answer because I would like to, I would like to live. Um, you know, those those pakoras don't buy themselves. But you know, uh, I should be making them. Don't tell my mother. <laughs> I'm busy. So I think showing up is also it's one thing to know that people are buying your work, and I that's great, that's fantastic. Please keep doing that. Um, but it's also really, really great to see bodies in the street and to have people physically show, like I think all of us have definitely have, if not one moment, plenty or many moments where actual South Indian people or South Asian people came to say hello and to say you mean a lot to me. That That is worth its weight in gold because yeah. it can be very much, it can be silent. I mean, having people buy your work is great and it's one kind of feedback, but a lot of times what you don't hear is from the people themselves, what they mean, like what you mean to them. And definitely, even if not like showing up to something like this panel, definitely like reach out to one of your favorite South Asian creators. If they mean something to you, you should be telling them that. Better to wait, but better to do it now than to wait like until you're dead. And you're like, man, that, that person meant a lot to me. Like, I can't believe they were the only one doing this. Like, why didn't you tell them why they were alive? Like, that's, that means, so it fuels me. It makes me so, like, happy and, ang like, angry and powered to have somebody come up to me and say, you mean a lot to me, and your work is essential, and I, like, I cried reading your thing, or I laughed, or something. That human connection is absolutely valuable and provides that to the community. I think outside of like buying the comic, if that's not in your, um, if that's not possible, you can always request them at the library. You can write a review on Goodreads or you can write a review on Amazon. Um, all of those things help build, you know, the um, foundation for a successful career, you know, for anybody who's in books. So um, those are some ways that you can do things that don't Libraries are so great. They yes. buy so many books. They do. I also want to just say this too. The South Asian community, I think, is pretty well connected in certain ways. And um, you know, uh, sending journalists, you know, someone's way. Uh, sometimes it really goes a long way. Sometimes it keeps it going a long way. Um, I think that's what my friends are. Oh yeah, you can you can request guests if if you want to see one of us in a show. They don't, they don't always pick, like find us, which is 
kind of sad, but you can always reach out to a lot of shows and be like, hey, I have this person that I think their work is fantastic, and I would love to see them. Or like at a book tour somewhere that you'd like a, like a speaking engagement or something. Those lines are open for you to ask those people, especially if you're an ally. Reach out mm -hmm. for sure. <laughs> I'm loud. I can hear it. Um, <laughs> uh, I would, not just the library agent things, but um, if you're into more mainstream comics and you want to be more mm -hmm. involved with the readers, yeah. uh, drawing people, writing people, um, reach out to the publishers themselves. Um, because they don't, they, it, it, we, the, the lack of connection to not just us, but um, all people of color on the industry is there's so much disconnect. So, if you like an artist or a writer and you want to see them know what it, what what's what's in that that hand, I don't know. Don't look at me. I'm an indie. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I was gonna say similar. You know, talking about it, and you know, because Dalton, you were saying like trade showcases. If there's things, you know, you can only support what's there. So if it's not there yet. You know, talking about it, you know, within your community and talking about it with publishers and stuff and saying, I want to see more of this, making it known that you want it to exist. Mm -hmm. Because, like, as I said, you can't, you know, if it's not there, you can't support it. And if it's not there, there's no, like, as we were discussing, like, there's no path sometimes to get it there. So, like, just talking about it and getting it out there. And it, it, it pays not to be funny. And uh, if you want more shame, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we need more white women to complain. <laughs> We're all going to demand the haircut. <laughs> I got so one. many of them, <laughs> and yet they don't use their power for good. <laughs> well, <laughs> does anyone else have any ways to support some of the South Asian community? Because otherwise, I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience. Before I realized I did not introduce myself, I apologize. I got really excited about all of them talking. My name is Preeti Chipper. I co-host the podcast Desi Geek Girls, which is a podcast about pop culture from a feminist Indian American lens. Um, so now we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. There is a mic back there, but it's kind of weirdly in the middle of the room. So if you can just, you could use it or you could just talk very loudly, whichever. Okay, we're gonna use the mic. So go ahead. Wait in a second. <laughs> so thank you so much for having this panel. I certainly didn't do this when I was younger. Um, so uh, kudos. My question is specific, and it's gonna lead into one of your acts that you made at the end of this panel. Um, everyone up here represents the South Asian community. Are any of you Muslim by any chance? Okay, so you are. Um, what's your name? Samita. Samita. So um, one of the things that you asked about was sending press your way. And as a member of media, I also want to let you know that the onus is a bit different when the press can take you down. Literally, sometimes with one person um, uh, looking, following a story and being told it's here. Mm -hmm. So if you know that press is going to be over here, and you know that you're, you're part of that story, you will make your way over there and introduce yourself. So okay. Samita? Samita, you should be in this same room on Saturday from 5 to 6 p.m. because they're having a panel on um, Muslims in the comic world and in the fan world. It's called Salam, Salam Fandom, right? Yeah. So be there because the press that's there to cover that, insert yourself in there. And in that way, you're not just representing yourself as a Muslim woman, but you will also be representing your rest of your panelists. And be sure that you mention that you're a panelist on and then name this panel and that can also get inserted into the story mm -hmm. so um it's just like storm right when she just first showed up you know she was she wasn't the star of that particular comic right but she was in there she's inserted and now decades later she's a standalone great character that's what you can do okay so i invite you to do that um media is really important it's what's going to sell your product it's what's going to let people know about you and when we're research, researching a story, literally, sometimes we just put in Muslim Comic Con. Um, so identifying all the intersections that you're in um, is going to let 
people or even someone just type, oh, I know someone, or what have you, but it'll lead back here. Make sense? Yeah. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask that if you have a comment to just come up and speak to the person after, because we only have a few minutes, so really this is for questions, but thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Rajiv Alam, and um, you probably remember me better as Blaze Alam. I created the world's first Indian American superhero in 1985, and I'm 12 years old, and I copyright it. That's why I own the name now. So Anand, when you speak about isolation, and you speak about being alone in this massive world of pop culture where our faces are not represented and reflected in it. I know we've been talking about this for the kids way back, and uh, I'm pleased to see all of you here representing South Asians, and I was really happy to watch over to this, uh, to this panel as soon as I can. I could, but so it's nice to see some reflection in the industry. Um, and I was a bit uh, upset to hear did it as a uh, sort of a, um, uh, as a revolutionary thing against the, the control in India. And South Asians will know a lot about this. We've spoken a lot about uh, a lot of us not becoming artists or creative people. But as you said, the culture will not uh, exist or uh, progress without us. And that's why we must take the responsibility on ourselves. We're also good at remaining invisible. And that's why uh, my character, Lazy now is very visible. And I am very out. sorry to interrupt you, but do you that's have a okay. question? Yes, I have a question. Okay. So uh, what do you intend, uh, what do you see as the future of representation in American pop culture for specifically Indian superheroes and South Asian superheroes, besides yourself? Per personally, I see an expansion. Um, as working in publishing now, there is definitely an outcry for more of that particular archetype. So as representation expands in not only DC Comics, but also different aspects of media, um, representation can lead to more representation. And especially in particular superheroes, which are trending right now, the more uh, representation and outcry we see for Indian American, South South Asian, Black, uh, Muslim, differently abled, that will lead itself into that trend. The trend itself is of superhero is not actually art so much as the overall hunger for representation. So I think that is where the actual onus of change lies, well, not necessarily. Because we're very seldom seen to play a role. But you know, that I don't think that's, I, I think that's gonna change, especially um, myself, I grew up reading the Mahabharat. I grew up reading about Indian gods and goddesses. To me, I was always heroic. So whether or not that we are portrayed as not heroic is not necessarily what lies in the hearts of people. And I don't really see that reflected in the people on this particular panel or the people up and coming right now. So I, I think there's definitely promise. I, I would love to see what you guys think about that. Well, Kamala Khan's getting her own movie. So fantastic. <laughs> And I think that is at, like representative of the trend that you're talking about, where um, representation is going to continue to expand, and we're going to keep talking about it. And I feel like the push and pull of the conversation of like people being like, oh, "You're taking up too much room, or not enough room, or this is misrepresentation, or this isn't enough representation." These are these are good conversations to have at the end of the day, because you're like. I consider them the growing pains of a multicultural society. So in order for us to really reach that um, ideal of a harmonious multicultural society, we're going to have to have more representation. And it's going to be a tough road, a lot of emotion, but it's going to be worth it. 
Yeah, I also want to point out, which I, I don't think is something that the conversation very often mention, but uh, lack of representation is a symptom of racism. So as long as we all work to make an anti-racist and non-racist society, it's a problem that then solve itself. I don't know that actually focusing on representational issues and the round face issue is going to fix things. We need to fix uh, the racism that keeps people out of the editing, out of hiring, out of publishing, out of making art, out of um, that keeps people traumatized and not able to create things. So it, it's a multifaceted, yeah. really um, terrible case, of <laughs> and, and it's all interconnected. So any, I feel like any activism you're doing, any protesting you're doing, any voting that you vote, vote uh, <laughs> <laughs> is gonna. It's, it's all gonna. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Last question. Hey, I'll try to make the context really fast. Uh, I'm half Iranian, half Pakistani. Went to music school originally from Illinois. Told a lot of those stories. I also have a sister, and I've noticed a lot of different changes uh, in getting my parents out of the school district. And I'm curious, uh, based on your own experience and observations, what, if any, differences do you think gender has in the uh, acceptance in certain <laughs> field males? <No. laughs> <laughs> Thank you.